Brad Wolf got money on every time I play. Yeah. Yes, he did. That's right. <laughs> you know, not only not only Chuck Lorre write it, but all the voices that you hear on there, that's also Chuck Lorre doing all. us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Marty! Can we, just, to, just to start this off, because this is such a special thing to have all of you guys sharing the stage with me, for all the fans out here, do you think, before we really get into the interview portion of this, can we just work our way down the line from Barry and just get a little glimpse of the voice stuff? I, I, it would be, the child in me needs this right now. Yes. Well, it's really easy for me to do, Mike, because... It's my voice, so that I just, I love all I have to do is lift it up about half an octave and uh, I'm Donatello. And, and then you're the quick bunny. And well, well another octave up. Higher than that's, that's right, then it's up there. But yes. Except when you're a be bat. Yeah, be bat. Say an octave Wait. lower. Well, uh, come on, let's just keep going, Renee. Come on, let's do this. This is April O'Neill of Channel 6 News. So excited to be here with Mike from Fox. It's amazing. Oh, my God. How about that? That was great. I got a box. Yes. Well, I'm Raphael of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I love hot marshmallow, marshmallows, tuna fish, and Doritos pizzas. <laughs> and I am a pretty much a smart ass in real life, so it was typecasting. Turtle power! Yeah! <laughs> yeah, turtle power! Cam? Hi, I'm Cam Clark, and I'm not glad. <laughs> Townsend? No, I'm Cam Clark. <laughs> oh, I'm Cam Clark. No, hey, we're Cam Clark, and we're... <laughs> Go among the dudes! Yeah. Yes. Right. We've got yes. Michelangelo, and I don't really like... Well, I do like pizza. For real. <laughs> I do, no. Anchovy and hot fudge, it's like my favorite, dudes. Excellent. And Pat? Well, you keep telling me about the good life, Mike, because it makes me want to puke. <laughs> My God. Look at the treat we are in Woo! store for right now. Clap it up. We got the original cast here. This is so exciting. All right. I don't know that we've been here with Pat and Renee. Right, right. 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 This is, this like is right. very unusual. Have this all is this. a first. Yeah, this is right. Hopefully right. not a last. Right. This is so exciting. We have so much to unpack. I want to get into you guys. I want to get into the experience. I want to get into your personal stories. I have tons of uh -oh. notes. We're going to be talking a lot about a lot of great stuff. But let's let me first start off with Rob because Rob and I we had a great conversation yesterday, yeah. and you know I think I loved your energy talking off camera with you and just learning about how much of a privilege you feel to do this, to work in this space, to get to interact with the fans. You guys are so genuine about your interest in being at events like this, at Unicon, and giving back to the fans. Could you maybe speak to some of the members, and you guys could join in as well, but Rob, kick it off with us and just kind of give us a glimpse of what this means to you and why doing the work you do and the work you love means so much to you because of the fans we have here today. Well, thank you, Mike. And first of all, it's very clear that you're a pro. You handled this going beautifully. Um, we're very lucky to be up here with you. But uh, Mike pretty much said it. Uh, we are all very aware of how fortunate we are to be in this position. It is nothing short of a privilege um, to be able to go to work with people whom you choose to have in your life. We have been friends for over three decades, and some of us have known each other longer than that. So when you're able to go to work every day and then go out and see what you've done, you know, for money that you would do, you did a job that you would literally do for free. And then you get a chance to go around two, three decades later and see how it's shared with your family. Isn't it wonderful? We have often three generations of people who love the shows on which we've worked. And our job is to be our job is to be in the happy business. And by virtue of the smiles that are elicited when Barry does his thing or Renee or Pat, we know that we've done our job right. And it is an absolute pleasure to be here with you folks. And um, and Kyle Frickin Bunga. There we go. I think what's, I'm going to speak for the fans for a second here because I think, you know, you guys brought life 
to the Turtles. You really did. You know, from the comic book to then getting into the animated life of this property, you guys are the voices behind making this resonate with us, and it's part of our childhood. That's why for youngsters, for people my age, people older, I mean, this, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, it's just like I was saying with Back to the Future, it's part of the lexicon. Maybe Pam, can you give us some insight on why, what you were thinking when you first took the job? Were you thinking, you guys have such an extensive resume with so much work you've done. Did you understand the gravity? At what point did you understand wow, this is going to change my life being a part of this property. Well, not at the time we were cast in the show, that's for sure. No, as I was saying a little bit yesterday, the playing field of the actors was quite small, actually. We were very fortunate to be around in a time when the community was very intimate, and if I didn't get the role, I knew who did. And it was like, hey, I heard, you know. And there was also this sharing things like, hey, Cam, I don't know if you read on this thing, but there's this thing, and there was a role on there that I thought. And we'd say, hey, you need to, you know what, I don't think I'm right for this, but, you know, Pat would be, Pat would be great, you know, for this kind of thing. And we worked like that. As far as the show itself, we'd all been working and auditioning for things, and it's, it's just like, Okay, I don't know what's a hit. I don't know what's a, what's gonna go when you go. Okay, it's He Man. It's it's uh, and, wh whatever it is, and then comes Ninja Turtles, and you audition for it. You go next, and you go about your day. And here's what's so interesting to me, because a guy like Barry at the end of the stage, Barry. I mean, growing up, you were on the Danny Thomas show. You were on Leave It to Beaver. You were on Jack Benny. Since you're five. So, I mean, you were part of legendary productions, legendary people. Are you able to gauge content when you're auditioning for things, when you start that young, and can you really see this is going to be a special thing? Never. <laughs> uh, unless you can get in that DeLorean. Never. Right. And go to that. And that's and if, if you've seen any of my movies by one, except for one, you know that I've never been able to gauge content. <laughs> and, uh, and I've made some of the worst movies ever made. But, but, um, but this, I thought, was a joke. I literally did. I had not heard of the comic book. My agent called me up. He said, I have an audition for you. As he's done, you know, he did every other day. And he said, I have an audition for you, and I said, okay, and, I wrote, and you're going to go to this studio, and you're going to this time, and I said, and I said, what's the project, and he said, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and as I said yesterday, I, I had two words for him, I just said, yeah, right, <laughs> and I just thought he was joking, I, I had no idea, I mean, so, but I did say, as I said yesterday as well, in case you were here yesterday, we don't want to repeat ourselves, but but I said yesterday that once I did read, we read for all four characters, and once I saw the drawings and saw the script, the, the few lines that we were given yeah. to read, I said, yeah, there's something here. Now, did I ever say it's going to be a hit? I No, I just said... There's something here that's interesting. Well, there was a, that I'd like to be involved. It's fascinating because I'm 29, and you know, this morning I was I, the past two days I've just been getting amped up with all the content just to, you know, get back in touch with my younger self, and it's been such a pleasure. And that's why you guys, what you do, is it means so much to us, like fans out here, because it allows us to really have our own personal DeLorean and time travel within our own history. Uh -huh. And that's what's so special about what you guys give us. But there is a sophisticated storytelling to the show. It really is super well done. Um, but let's get back to how you guys read to all four characters. So how did that go about? How did the choosing of, you know, personality and all that stuff, how did that all come about? It's, Townsend, you're in Pat. What do you guys have to say about that? Well, uh, we, we, yeah, when, uh, when I auditioned for the show, uh, I read for all four turtles. And when they actually cast us, um, actually, Robbie and I were working on a show called Fraggle Rock before Turtles, and the guy who was voice directing Woo! that show, yeah, thank you. Uh, Wendley, you rock dust allergies all in your head. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Stu Rosen, the guy who was voice directing the show, came into one of our Fraggle Rock sessions and said, you guys aren't going to believe what I'm going to be casting and directing next. Pulls out a copy of a Ninja Turtle comic book out of his briefcase, 
and shows us, and I basically had the same reaction Barry did. I'm like, oh, yeah, well, good luck with that. You know, I mean, this was the days when, you know, it was My Little Pony and, and Strawberry Shortcake and shows Little Clowns of Happy Town. <laughs> little Clowns of Happy Town. And, you know, so Ninja Turtles, was, it was, it sounded way out there. And, uh, but when I auditioned for it, um, and again, like Barry, um, it, it had some real meat to it. And, and so in our first session, uh, we knew that they cast Barry as Donatello, Rob was Raphael, but they hadn't yet decided whether Cam or I were going to be Michelangelo and Leonardo. And they were going to I introduced myself as Michelangelo, <laughs> which is as close as I actually ever got since the, so, that first so, fateful day. So what happened was at that very first recording session, they were just gonna they were gonna record it twice. And they were gonna have me do Michelangelo first. Yeah. And then on the second pass, have Cam do Michelangelo. And then they were gonna make their decision after that. Well after we did the first pass and I was Michelangelo, they just never told us to switch for that second pass. And I asked Stu, Stu about it and he was busy with other things. He said, "Ah, don't even worry about yeah, it. Yeah, we, we gotta keep moving. moving. We gotta keep moving." Wow. Yeah. Oh, sweet. So it really is stage. Yeah. It wasn't was like the, there was a whole deliberate like meeting about okay, well, you know, towns and your personality is really conducive to the. There wasn't no, was anything just, like that. It was just not Tony. Why don't you do Cam? Uh, you, you, you do Michelangelo first. first and they literally just went. Uh, uh, you start with uh, <laughs> Mikey and Kevin. Okay, Paolo, you'll do that part. Right. Exactly. I've got a kind of a unique story. I don't know about share with some of you guys is that uh, Stu Rose who uh, directed the pilot on a Saturday and took four roles. Yeah. Fred Wolf was so angry he fired him and hired me. I said I can't do four roles and so Vernon went to Pete Wait, are you serious? Yes. I don't know this. Vernon what? went to Pete Renaday and I took the other one. Yeah, because we can only do three, they could only get us for three roles. Right. We had no yes. guess. That's why Barry and Cave got great rock stack and bebop because they were so odd. But <laughs> well, yeah, it's because Cam and Barry were so odd. Pat referenced our friend Pete Renaday, who could not be here. Pete is Master Splinter. And Pete was, yes, we love Mr. Mr. Renaday. He was also, at one point, the voice of Mickey Mouse. Wow. Yeah. And so Pete was uh, Master Splinter and Vernon. And Vernon, right? He, we laughed more at Vernon. Yeah. Who was Vern Thompson's assistant. Yeah. Vernon. <laughs> right? Than anything else in the show. Remarkable. Been recording for nine years. It's, Lovely man. There's so many, so many things to get to. Uh, Renee, I want to talk to you because I really think hey, you're a girl. I, <laughs> I really think you know. To me, April O'Neil, it, it made it was the glue that made everything work because it exactly. it really had the human component that we needed. You were our eyes, our ears. Your voice, it, it was, you're, you did such an incredible job of making something that seems so out there real. And I want to know how you did that as an actor. Uh, uh, I got cast. <laughs> That's very kind of you to I mean, say that I'm the glue. That is the first time, first time anybody's ever said that. That's really? Very, very kind of you. That's a great question. I think it's yeah. true. I mean, very do you agree with me? Uh, yes, of course I agree with you. <laughs> and how did you make that work? Tell us, you know, as an actor, I know you're from Chicago, right? I was born in Chicago. Yeah, Chicago people mean business. I went to Northwestern. I love Chicago people. I know you showed up there like a professional. You must have had an actor, you know, hat on your head saying, what can I bring to this role? How am I going to take this to the next level being a on wheel? Tell us how you did that. Tell them what our director, Stu, said to you. Oh, yes, of For course. starters, this will give you some so, character building. Uh, yeah. See, there we go. Char character building in a not great way. Um, so. What doesn't after, kill you makes you strong, yes, darling. Yes, true. So uh, after the first um, rehearsal of the first episode, everybody was kind of taking a break, and Stu came up to me. He, he smoked she kind of bit. This is Sue Blue, the chief the voice director of the. Of he the, would always mock. Well, the imitation you do of Stu with a cigarette yeah, in one hand and a donut in that. the other. I can hear this cat barking. You know, got, I you know, I'm trying to lose weight on eating a donut. <laughs> so, he, <laughs> so he came up to me in that break. You know, I have to tell you that you know you think that we're all confident and you know, we're all that, but the fact is we each have our own insecurities. So, you know, 
if you've got yours, just know we have ours. So you're never quite sure if you're going to keep the role they give you. There have been plenty of times when we've all been cast in something, and the next thing you know, the door has hit us in the back. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he came up to me and he said, well, you know, I didn't think you were right for this. And I didn't even play your audition for them. But then I played everybody else's in town, and that was in April. So I said, well, I have one more. <sighs> and I played yours and your April. I'm like, holy moly, am I keeping this job or not? So, um, with that voice, you sound like you could be Bob's wife. Yeah, and you know, in the next version of TV. And the thing that's, I guess, standing where I'm standing, and I'm thinking as the fans in the audience, you know, we look at you guys and we just think the amount of talent on this stage is incredible. And the takeaway, and I think Rob, you should answer this, you know, or at least start off the answer is the amount of talent that you guys have, whether it's cultivated, whether it's innate. To just be a good person and to have that fortitude and to believe in yourself during these times. I mean, you would just think the talent is enough. I, I can't do these voices. And then to see the talent you have and then to re recognize it's not just about talent. You've got to have that whole other, you know, that the, the attributes of that other side of your physical makeup are so crucial. Can you kind of give us a glimpse for people out in the stands, people who are listening to this, they want to dream of doing what you guys are doing. Tell us about those intangibles Thank that you. are hard to quantify. Thank you, Mike. And that's exactly what it is. They are hard, difficult to quantify because it's, it is difficult, uh, especially for the circumstance that Renee found herself in. You're very excited. And then uh, I think people who are artistic, actors, performers, artists, are by nature fairly sensitive people. We just are, because we're unafraid to, and, and we embrace uh, performing and taking on different characteristics. But the human aspects of what make you sensitive can put you in a pretty precarious position, like Renee just suggested. And to not be taken aback, and to not say, oh, what a, what a nasty thing to say. And it was. It was not a pleasant thing to say. But Renee pushed through it did a great job, and trust me, I've been in positions, all of us have, as Renee suggested, where we get the job, and then a few set, a few episodes in, we get taken aside and say, <coughs> yeah, can we call you? You're not, you just, you know, we decided that we're going to go with someone else. And it's heartbreaking. Um, so it is an intangible, and uh, I think that you do also have to cultivate that ability to let things roll off your back and just say, well, okay, I didn't get this one or I got it and then it was taken away from me um, and you keep pushing through. And to understand that it is not personal is very difficult sometimes. Barry, Barry I would like you to jump in because yeah, so I need to jump in oh, yeah, on yeah. this one because Cam knows exactly what we're talking about. And this is a true very, story. My very first series job, I started doing a little guesting. You know, yeah, yeah. My first series was on the remake of Johnny Quest. I was cast as Haji. And having grown up with that show as a reboot, that relate, you know, y'all talk about that was our childhood. Right, right. Again, this is me getting to do something from my childhood. I go home, I tell my family, hey, da, 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 da. after like two episodes or for one episode, agent, I'm at the office and my agent comes in, Rita comes in, and she goes, oh, honey, you, uh, you've been replaced as Haji. And I went, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Rob stole the part from me. <laughs> he went over to Joe Hannah Barbera and said, you know, I think I'd be a much better Haji than Cam Clark. <laughs> and that's exactly, that's how, exactly it how it happened. <laughs> wow. Uh, and and uh, I did not know that. I did not know that so many years ago. I never knew that. And it, it's heartbreaking because I've been in that. It position. killed. It killed. Yeah. But I would also add when you talk to the, about the intangible. Yeah. Many years after... I started getting involved in this, and this world got a little more uh, high profile. P actors and such would come and go, hey, I hear this is a really hard field to get into. 
I'd have to say that when I started doing voice, I didn't know that. So I didn't have in my brain, this is hard, this is hard, this is a one in a million shot. I just went, oh, voiceovers. Okay, I'll have chocolate right. and Jamocha almond fudge. <laughs> it was like, and you, it, it worked. But you I had no negativity right. going in. Naivete worked in my favor, I think, for once. Ignorance was bliss. Yeah, yeah it is. What do you think, Sorry, Barry? Well, I, I I think you have to have a realistic perspective. Um, and, you know, I ended up doing something that I never thought I'd do, which was to teach, because I decided to sort of retire. Um, and I retired. Um, basically, I loved the work, but I didn't love the rat race, you know, and it got more and more of a rat race as time went on. And then... Um, and some of you know that I'm not a very strong presence on social media. And so it all became, you know, about how many followers you had, even to get a guest role in television, you know, it was very weird. Yeah. So, so I started teaching and I taught um, film acting uh, if, in, in uh, Masters of Fine Arts uh, program. And they would, you know, all come in saying, you know, I'm going to be a star. And I said, if you start that way, you're not going to finish that way. So just start by trying to be a good actor. You know, let's start also, there. Let me interject something. We, we, we touch on that. It must be really hard. No one on this stage, no one was forced to be an actor. Right. No one. It is a choice. So when people use the word, isn't it hard? Well, hard is pouring a hot tar on the freeway in Vegas. Yeah, that's uh, work. That's work, man. That's a hard gig. Right. It's difficult to make a living as an actor, but it's a choice. We're here because we want to be, and we have been far more fortunate than many actors. Or there are people right over there who are world-class artists. Every time we do one of these gigs, we see some work that just blows our minds. Yeah. And those folks are lucky if they can make a car payment. You know what I mean? But none of them would trade it for a regular job because they're driven to do this. Right. So we're very fortunate to make a living, but we do it because we can't not do it. I gotcha. But you, know? you can't you can't take it personally. You absolutely yeah. can't. It's it's batting average, you know, it's it's going up for things and recognizing the fashion saying I read for all four and I said I hope I get Donatello. If I get anything in the really show, I want Donatello. And why was that? I identified with him. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not science guy, yeah. but I'm nerd guy. You know, I had yeah. hoped I would to give me an example. Deal. While we did the, wait, while we did the, oh, and I know you heard for Krang, uh, Pat. Well, the recordings of uh, while we did that, Barry went through law school with his books on. Wow, his, recording. Really? While we recorded, he bring his books in and became a lawyer. So. Yeah, so at a session, and had never every, missed every, a cue. He'd have that's four thing. books yeah. on his lap, oh and he's, my God. he's got his yellow marker. Oh, like, like, I like. And you actually became a lawyer? Like, yeah. you graduated? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he was a, I, I didn't like it. I practiced for three years and went right back to acting. But he also became the president of the Screen Actors Guild for seven years. Yes. Yes. So our union... That was our president for seven years. That's amazing. Now let's let's get back to, yeah, take to, it to Ninja though. Turtles for a second. Because yeah. you guys have such a vast career. I mean, Rob, we were talking about all the different things from Animaniacs, Pinky and the Brain, so many things. Uh, Townsend, I mean, you just with the tick. I mean, so much stuff. You, you guys have done so many iconic things. But still, Ninja Turtles is the thing that probably everybody just comes up to you on the street to try to talk to you about Townsend. What is it about Ninja Turtles that eclipses everything else? You know, I think, and we hear this all the time at these cons, the stories that people tell about how when they were kids, they were, you know, six, eight, you know, 12 years old and going through tough stuff in their lives. And they were able to um, somehow latch on to generally one of us characters because of a character trait that we had that helped them through with some difficult times in their lives. Um, it was more than just entertainment. Yeah. You know, I think when we were doing the show, of course, we thought that it was just that. It was just entertainment. 
but uh, you know, come to find out all these years later that uh, it had a, 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 in some cases, a really profound impact. And, so, on, on, and this is what's so interesting, and I would love all you guys to jump in on answer this because this might be a bad question. Uh, as a journalist, I'm going to take a chance here, but I think I'm you super say therapist or journalist. I see. I, I kind of do both. I'm geeking out actually about the process. I want to know the behind the scenes of you guys actually recording dialogue. I'm trying to think, like I was, before coming to today, I'm thinking you guys are in the booth. And are you, is it physical? Or are you in like an athlete? I know Rob grew up as a hockey player. Like, are you sweating? <laughs> are you moving around? Are you, I are you I if you wore a Fitbit, would you have ran 80,000 miles by the time you record an episode? What does it look like? When you record, well, we I were sitting down. Started a, a, a step before that. Yeah. You said earlier about the smallness of our community. Yeah. A great starting point is you know, like you walk in the first day of school and you see who the classmates are. We all have been with each other on other little jobs and such, and knowing how towning works. Just for starters, I know how Pat, Pat and I were on Denver the last dinosaur. I, I know, we know each other's beats. So it's kind of like a band, everybody had played together in the jazz quartets and trios before, and then when the quartet came together, it was like Coltrane knows where Miles is going to go. Ha, 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 much. But physically, in the, we're all in the room together. And we're seated, and we're seated. Right. All, it's all in an arc. See, this is why I want to know that. I didn't know yeah, how this so was. Well, what does it look like? It was always to the left of me. You Paint know? a picture. I mean, I should we play musical me. chairs? I was it's next to Raphael, Rob Paulson, and my only job was to make him laugh. And he used to literally hand me my hand lips. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now I'll give you one example. Wait, you say, who used to hand you ad lips? Rob. Rob. That's Sean Bobby's role. He'd hand me my ad -libs. Really? Okay, I'll give you an example. <laughs> First year, got away with murder of ad lips. I had a line that said, How would you like to be boiled in oil? <laughs> he goes, No, no, here. And he gives me a line. I look at him. My turn comes, and here's the line that literally isn't in the show that made it. How would you like to be born in oil with just a touch of cilantro? Oh my god. <laughs> This is so Wait, paid. So I really want to I want to break this okay. down because I find this super fascinating. So let's go back to like the jazz analogy, which I think is good. You know, jazz, you these guys are high-level musicians. Thelonious Monk is learning classical piano before he breaks the rules and does all his other stuff that we know that's difficult. So you guys had a script as the classical script to, to kind of like work off of. But you were encouraged to ad lib a lot? How did that work? Renee, how did that work? So that's a great question because we weren't really encouraged no. to ad lib. <laughs> well, not on this show. <laughs> no, well, no, the first year we got away with murder. Yeah. But Rob, that was it. Rob and I loved the ad libbing in part. And but so how the second, wait, the second year, yeah. when it became popular, it was like union arbitration to get an ad lib through. It would be taken because the script had gone through so many levels of approval. By the time it got to us, they didn't want us messing with the words. So these guys would be. I, I always describe our recording like your your parents dropped you off and said, <laughs> "There's the sandbox. You can sit in the sandbox, and you can gently play with the sandbox, but don't throw any sand." And then the parents... But don't go to the bathroom <laughs> in the sandbox. So, so then the parents would drive off and all these guys would start throwing sand all over the room. <laughs> the the ad-libs were amazing. And that's what developed the characters. You know, all of the Ninja Turtles, the, the light... I, I said it yesterday. The life of the Ninja Turtles was created by these master actors and comedians and... and uh, creative talent, the words that were written on the page and the line drawings of these characters were clever. Right. But they took them to another level. And when they could, the most wonderful lines in the show were really created by this cast. But, but, but Renee, you, you have to include yourself yes. in, in this. It's not just they. It's, right. it's well, all of us ensemble. Very kind. But, you know, April was the straight person, the straight man, the straight woman. 
So she was like the, you know, the George Burns to the Gracie Allen. And, yeah. and, and the, the cleverness of what you guys did, meshing the Marx Brothers with uh, Abbott and Costello and, and every classic um, group of, of, of people who came before us in comedy. If, if you guys really watch these scripts and listen to the, the, the dialogue, and then go back through comic history, you will see amazing things from these guys. And, and I definitely think Cam had the funniest lines in the show. As I recall, and maybe I'm not remembering correctly, <laughs> am I? No? Um, okay, okay, okay. No. Speaking of the straight man, this is, pardon, pardon the this is Cam's <laughs> classic turtle line. Well, well no, I'll, 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 I'll get to that. But <laughs> Renee says she was the straight man, as was I, in a manner of speaking. And I got these three goofballs doing, you know, and so I'm thinking, as the leader, maybe I can yeah. spoof the leader. And uh, and do like an over the top uh, superhero as this because I was getting jealous of all the yucks uh, that these three were getting, and the director Sue like a, I'm, I'm called out into the hallway. He says, "Cam, Cam, come out here. What are you doing?" I'm like, "Well, I'm just trying to make just trying to make Leonardo funny by making him more like this." And she goes, "Yeah, don't. <laughs> You're." the later and the straight guy. And so I appreciate what you're saying, Renee. I had I had to be yeah, while well, these guys bound these coconuts bound these all these other right. coconuts bounced off. And it, it, but it fosters a foundation for good comedy to have that. Somebody has to be uh, Dean Martin to Jerry Lewis. Right. Now what uh, they're saying about what's my funniest line was every episode I would say <clears throat> We gotta think of something fast. <laughs> I wanna, I wanna know when you guys are growing up. Was this like, was voices and things like that? I mean, Barry, you were, you know, a youngster doing, you know, so much stuff. But you know, he, he's saying, I "Ain't getting nothing for Christmas." Right? That's all. That's Barry Gordon, ladies and gentlemen. Barry Gordon right there. Is, is, are you kind of going by the day-to-day -day of going to school, going to the supermarket, were you constantly talking to yourself kind of in almost a Tourette's kind of way with voices? What, how was Favorite it? Favorite Christmas present was a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, I kid you not, at like, yeah. at like nine years old. Under the Christmas tree is a real to real if you even know and what that is. Cam, tell us what don't. you would do. What would you do? Give us a interview place. myself. <laughs> I have a little microphone and I go, Yes, we're well, on the Cam Clark show and you know, my guests today are Jerry the refrigerator magnet. Jerry, what's going on? Oh, yes, Cam, thank you for having me on your show. What's going on in there? Who's in there with you? <laughs> and is it true, Townsend, do you think, kind of like the book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, it sounds funny, but you guys were developing your 10,000 hours of skills, right? I mean, no, yeah, no, no, no question about it. My dad, who, who was on the radio when I was a kid, and, and very much into old-time uh, radio dramas and stuff like that. That's what I grew up with listening to. Yeah. And so I, like Cam, also got a little reel-to-reel -reel machine when I was probably eight or nine years old and did similar stuff. But my dad had this habit of talking to himself, and it drove our family crazy. It drove my mom crazy. And I have inherited that, <laughs> that illness. I guess. <laughs> and so I find myself talking to myself all the time. And you went to University of Colorado, and you became a disc jockey eventually, like your father. What made you break away from more of a structured career and kind of, even though disc jockey is still out there, but, you know, what yeah, made you break? Six, that's six days a week, you know, when you're on right. here and then doing production and stuff, and it's like, <laughs> this is too much like a real job for me. You know, I, want, I wanted to be an actor. So once I quit radio in 84, I just, it was either New York or L.A. I was going to go and pursue acting, and so I chose L.A., came out to L.A. in uh, the fall of 84. Was very lucky, got an agent pretty quickly, 
and uh, six months later got an audition for a show called Inspector Gadget. Yes. Uh, here's the thing. I came out to L.A. with absolutely zero notion of ever doing cartoons. It just wasn't on my radar at all. I was going to be an on-camera guy. And, and, but when I went on this audition and I got this little part for the last ten episodes of, of Gadget, I said, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in a studio with Maurice LaMarche, Frank Welker, me, and Don Adams. Wow, Don that's Adams. My, that's my first session. Wow. And I was blown away by not only getting to meet Don Adams, get right. smart, but, but also getting to meet Maurice LaMarche, had no idea who he was, and it was his first cartoon series. And, uh, and Frank Welker, who was the absolute king of voiceover back then. And I just said to my agent, man, this is crazy fun. Send me out on more of this stuff, can't right. you? Please? And I want to bring in I want to bring in Rob for a second because we were talking about this off camera yesterday um, before our more show on Fox Five interview. Recalibrating was the word that we were discussing. You know, as we were alluding to earlier, you guys have such a vast career. You you know you've done so many different things. You're coming from all different backgrounds, but it's all a performance kind of based thing. And when you went out to LA, coming from Michigan at 22, just like Townsend, cartoons, animation wasn't at the top of your mind, but you recalibrated. Yes, well, in fact, pretty good. Pat Fraley, our, our lovely brother Pat, has got an Ivy League degree from Cornell yeah. in performance, in theater, and acting. Um, and I came to LA, like pretty much all of us, Renee's a fine, world-class singer, and, um, ostensibly to do live action and music. I was a singer first. But I, I believe all of us, lived that axiom that luck is when opportunity meets preparation. And what happens is you right, you do recalibrate. We all know people who came to LA to be actors and they found that they were good writers and producers and now they run shows. Um, I just wanted to work. I just love to be creative. But and then for everybody out there who doesn't have the confidence to recalibrate, right. one, it's about that you guys stayed with it. It's about the obstacles that when things weren't maybe flowing as much in this direction, you looked within yourself and you were like, you know what, this is an opportunity. It's not a bad thing. Right. It's an opportunity. That's exactly right. The question is uh, recognizing the opportunity. And folks, it's not just about show business. It's being sensitive enough to just say, um, oh my goodness, I've been preparing for this for a long time. Now there's an opportunity. Holy crap, I think I'm fixing to get lucky. And that's how that works. Had it not been for the fact that we chose to go to Hollywood to apply what our ostensible trade was, we would never have gotten lucky. And I, I think that that is true in virtually everyone's life. Sometimes something shows up in a guise that is not exactly what you expected, but if you're willing to take a shot, all of a sudden, you look back a few years later and say, boy, am I ever glad that I went out on that date, on that ride, even though I didn't want to, because I met the man or woman of my dreams that utterly changed my life. I met the turtle of my See, Pat, of my Pat, I want to bring you in. Because, guy. Guy. Pat, coming from Seattle, and like Rob said, being part, uh, Ivy League education, Cornell, on stage there, I mean, what? I tap dance through school. You know, literally, uh, my greatest accomplishments in life are I'm tall, reasonably good looking, and white. That's it. We know too many people that have had adversity, but I just tap dance through school. And I, well, I'd like to add one more thing, Mike. We're all failures. Everyone that was a success at uh, Voice Over, except Corey Bird and Bob Bergen, were failures. We've, I feel I'm a failed theater actor. On camera actor, you know, singer, and, and but there's that part that Rob was talking about about, you know, Denzel Washington says it. He goes, if you fall down seven times, get up eight. That's right. And so we got up. I mean, I was in a studio doing a duck voice over in Australia, and uh, I was doing Shakespeare. Oh, it was okay, you know, <laughs> but it would, you know, check off the pilot light went out, you know. So I'm doing. I'm in the studio. And the guy says, uh, oh, we like you. I go, why? And he goes, oh, you're so big. We can't get the other actors to be that big. Well, then, well, okay, there it is. Three years later, I've been Hannah Barbera. Yeah. So let me ask you this. The cliche question or response for the person who doesn't look at the world with that perspective is like, 
I'm coming from Cornell, I'm studying Shakespeare, this animation stuff, I'm too good for this, or I'm not gonna do this. And that's probably an internal fear that they probably have. It's probably a lack of self-confidence. What was that internal thing inside of you that gave you the ability to look at this as an opportunity? Is that something that can be trained? Is that something I, I that comes from your parents? For the most part, most of us that do this, this wasn't in the plan. We did what we accidentally, like, oh, there's the voices. Of, what is yeah. this? We, when I was little, I used to play army, and they loved to shoot me because I died really well. Yeah. And so, but not only would I die, you die well, really like oh, you, yeah. you could act being murdered. Well, uh, how, how, you got to say, you got to say, often aren't you back in the a little bit? <coughs> so not only did I die well, but I was teaching how to die, and it's the same after Cornell and. There are a lot of actors who don't die well. People. I will say that, but I. I Oh, yeah. They love me. I, I never said, just crease me. <laughs> I'd get gut shot. That's completely changed, though, in some ways. Some of what we're talking about has changed. When I had students, the first thing they asked me was, how do you get into voice work? Um, voice work is, is something that people really, really, really want to do. And, and when I got into voice work, I didn't think of it as... A come down in any way. I, I thought of it as another way to act. I mean, I worked as an on-camera actor and and had some success. And and so when when the opportunity came, it was kind of exciting, you know. And I watched Huckleberry Hound and the Flintstones and and Rocky and Bullwinkle. And so when I got a chance to play in that sandbox. You know that was a really exciting thing to see, and 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 I, uh, I've loved it ever since. So to me, in, in many ways, on camera is tougher because yeah. because on camera, you know, I'm what five, you know, four on a good day, and uh, you know, so it, that's just hard to get some of the roles you want. Well, the <laughs> jump that I had when I was um, as I was getting older and I was about to approach adulthood. And I had an agent who said, you'll never work in this business. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, because you'll make John Wayne look out of proportion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell so you what. that's what you confront as an on-camera actor. With an off-camera actor, you don't confront anything, you know? You sit that in was front a of the... I will say, you did play the perfect you rabbi in Curb Your Enthusiasm, though. You. But that was a boon to me as well. I, I, I had done MacGyver and Sand Elsewhere and a bunch of on-camera stuff, a pile of commercials. And then I went and did my first cartoons, which were G.I. Joe and Transformers, Neil Ross and Frank Welker and Peter Cullen. And the first thing I noticed was a half a dozen actors whom I'd recognized from episodic television, and none of them were limited by how they looked. None of them. It was, to me, the purest form of acting, like... To very use the word in a in a really bitchin' sandbox, and I thought, oh my God, nobody cares that I'm an average-looking 25-year-old kid from Detroit. I can be a monster, a bad guy, a good guy. I'm limited only by my creativity and the kindness of people to hire me. And let me tell you, you nailed it, Barry nailed it. There is a cool cachet now to be on a cartoon show. Mark Hamill is a dear friend of all of ours. But you know, one of his favorite things is the fact that he got to be on The Simpsons as himself. That was a big deal. I directed the most, the last iteration of Ninja Turtles. I was the voice director at, at uh, Nickelodeon. We had John Cena. We had, um, uh, oh gosh, uh, uh, yep, Seth Green, um, uh, Lena Headey from uh, um, Game of Thrones. They could not be more excited to yeah. be on Ninja Frickin' Joe. When I went in to read at a, my last callback uh, on the version in which I played Donatello in 2012 at Nickelodeon, I went in for my final callback, and in the room waiting to go in were Jason Bateman and John Cryer, wow. neither of whom needed a dime. It wasn't about that. It was about, quote, from Jason, are you kidding me? This is Ninja effing Turtles. Right. This is a big deal, and we're grateful to be part of it. It's amazing. It's 
What are the sh car what are the animated shows right now that you guys watch that are so good that when you watch you're like, oh, I wish I could be a part of this. I, this is just so well done. What are some of those favorites? Simpsons, still. Still Simpsons. Yeah, I love Simpsons. And Simpsons for me too. Yeah. And uh, Rick and Morty. As Rick well. and Morty, yeah, it's great. Yeah, great. Um, um, Renee, if you had advice for people that are out there right now, you know, kind of like how Cam was saying. And Townsend, they're like, well, you know, the best gift I could ever get on Christmas was a cassette tape so I could hear myself. Well, now... No, not cassette. Well, real to real. Real to real. <laughs> Earlier. Back okay. it up. Okay. Back it up. I'm born in 92. I just forgot about that. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I was born in 1892, so... You look amazing. Yes. We're going to talk about the creams and I all that have, stuff, because I held the pattern for fire. You're welcome. But what? <laughs> See, that's why he wrote the ad libs right there. Um... Renee, you know, I guess what I was trying to get to when I got the technology screwed up uh, was, I mean, you can do a podcast in your grandmother's basement now. People are on TikTok. Your phone has so many qualities and tools. What would, advice would you give to youngsters out there, people who are out there and just, you know, they want to maybe try to awaken this ability within themselves. How can we practice? What's the best way to practice with the tools we have? That's a great question. Um, there's so many ways to answer that. I, I started with actually a chatty Kathy doll. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. She had a little button on her chest, and you would uh, push it one way, and you could record, and then you'd push it another way, and it would play back, and then you could push it another way and erase it and start over again. Wow. So wow. that was my first experience in practicing voices. Yeah. Um, and my advice is, um, there's a lot of advice, and all of us could give it. Um, number one, you should have many more voices than one. Many people come to us and say, I have this really great voice, and everybody says I should be a voiceover. <laughs> you say, okay, you got any more? No, this is it. <laughs> so, so I always describe voiceover as having a deck of playing, and then depending on the game you're playing, you combine the cards. It could be blackjack or poker or any number of things. So you take a little bit of this card and that, and you mix it together and come up with a character. Um, the technology is important, but you can use your iPhone to, to practice. But number one is to take lessons from great teachers like Pat Fraley and Sue Blue and anyone out there now who is teaching because they have the step up and the insight and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So I would definitely some, reach out to Pat. Yeah, He's check out Pat's advice. Brilliant teacher. That's great advice. We have a couple minutes left. I wanted to say, everybody, we give a round of applause to this great, Woo! this great talent we have on the stage right now and how great they are to just be with us right now. It's and we'd like to give a round of applause to you guys who are the reason we can be here. It's such a special, beautiful Alexis. It's such a special thing. We got a couple minutes left. Maybe we can just work our way down the line. If you, I don't want you to give you guys the opportunity to maybe mention something that I couldn't get to. I know it's trying. I'm trying to have personal one-on-one -on -one conversations with all of you here because I love all of you guys. But Barry, let's start with you. Just work your way down. Say something you want to say, something I didn't get to, anything like that. The one thing that wasn't said um, in the very first question when you asked about us and the Comic-Cons and, you know, getting together. And Rob, so well thanked everybody here. I want to thank you for another reason, because as happens in show business, you love people when you work with them and then you don't see them for a very long time. And it was really because of you and the fan base that this band got together again. And now, uh, as I've sometimes said at cons, I have four brothers and uh, three brothers and a sister that I did, well now four actually, but I don't get to see that very much. But I have brothers and sisters that I never had. And, um, and you, you are to be thanked for that um, because we've really developed an incredibly close bond and close friendship. And it's because of you. 
so Harry kind of said it all. Um, he's right. Brothers, I, I always refer to you guys as my turtle brothers. And um, how lucky are we? Thank you for being there for us and for loving us and for being in our lives. You mean so much to us, you have no idea. I, there's, I, ditto. It's the most remarkable things I've made friends like Alexis, other people who have been kind enough to pay attention to us over the years and to know that our job has resulted in like this gentleman with his beautiful baby sitting right up in front and Braden and people who are uh, who go out of their way to drive here, sometimes fly here, buy a ticket, stand in line, go out of their way just to come up and say thank you to us. We leave these events utterly exhausted from saying thank you to you. And I promise you there is no better way to move through life. So thank you. Um, I'm a Scorpio. <laughs> I'm in my late, late, late 40s. <laughs> <clears throat> late fifth, late fifth. I like long walks on the beach, candle at dinners. Um, I have a table over here. If you'd like to say hello. I'm, I'm just going to piggyback on, on what Barry said and, and, uh, and Renee and Robbie too. Um, if it weren't for you guys, there would be no us. Right. And I mean, that's just real and true. Uh, in our first season, if you guys hadn't latched on to us the way you did, um, and we wouldn't have been renewed for a second season. Um, but you did, and you have ever since. And I, I've met a, a number of people uh, yesterday and today who have traveled uh, long distances. I've met already four or five people who have come from Texas, Houston, and Dallas. One guy flew in today to be here for just six hours to meet us, and then is flying back to Dallas tonight. That, that, that is just, just astounding to me. Um, and so thank you. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for loving us um, and allowing us to love you back. Um, this, is, this is just wonderful. Okay, my name, pathfraley.com. No, no, if you go there, you'll find free lessons. Yes. Over a hundred of them yeah. on voice. Fantastic. That's great. So pathfraley.com. Free, and, and, and let me also just one quick plug for D. Bradley Baker, who's here this weekend, has a website just simply titled I Want to Be a Voice Actor.com. Check it out. It's all free stuff, just like much of Pat's stuff is. And and these are brilliant men who, who are sharing their knowledge and, uh, and their experience with you guys. So check them out. Thank you guys so much. It was an honor to share the stage with you. We had such a great time. Clap it up one more time. Original cast, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Thank you.